Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, we will begin our final panel of this conference today at this exceptional conference. And since this is the last panel of this event, it will also serve as a kind of conclusion to the work conducted at this conference. We would like to uh, give a warm thanks to the ambassadors and permanent representatives from Azerbaijan, Lithuania, Angola for taking part in this panel entitled, How Does Multi-Faith Awareness Influence Education? How can we share experience on interreligious dialogue? We would also like to uh, warmly thank the Secretariat of UNESCO for its active participation in this last panel, represented by the Assistant Director General of the Africa Department of UNESCO, as well as uh, representative from the Social and Economic Dialogue Division and the UNESCO Chair on Religious Pluralism and Peace. The second individual is the Chief of Section Intercultural Dialogue. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Amina Hamshari, a program specialist in the Intercultural Dialogue Division of the Sector for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO, to take the stage so that she can moderate this panel. Please. I would also like to invite our presenters to take the stage. Professor Alberto Meloni, who is the UNESCO Chair on Religious Pluralism and Peace at the University of Bologna. As well as His Excellency Mr. Anar Karimov, Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of Azerbaijan to UNESCO. I would also like to invite His Excellency Mr. Diakumpuna Sitan Dasisi Jose, Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of Angola to UNESCO, as well as Mr. Director of Religious Affairs at the Ministry of Culture of Angola, Mr. Castro Maria. Additionally, I would also like to invite Her Excellency Irena Weissvilaite to come up and take the stage. She is Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of Lithuania to UNESCO. We will also be joined a bit later, but at the same panel, by another guest, Mr. Mr. Edouard Firmin Matoko, Assistant Director General of the Africa Department of UNESCO, and we will uh, welcome him. We, we would like to warmly uh, welcome this last panel, and I would now like to give the floor to the moderator. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Nice to see you back here again. And as 
the MC has indicated, the topic of discussion today has to do with multi-faith awareness. How does it influence education? And what kinds of experiences can we share on inter-religious dialogue? I am extremely honored to have this opportunity to serve as the moderator of this panel discussion. And this afternoon, our panel will uh, focus on several different topics. For example, what is the role of a religious education or of learning about religion in intercultural dialogue, an interreligious dialogue? What topics are necessary for uh, an authentic interreligious dialogue? What are the, necess- what are the shared um, values in religious, interreligious dialogue? Uh, what about the rights of women, mutual understanding and intercultural education? How can we teach uh, cultural diversity and emphasize the importance of intercultural culture to young people? Uh, and while outlining its role in human history, how can we coexist in the cultural diversity without imposing a dominant cultural culture on others? Or how can we encourage the culture of peace? How can we create uh, an intercultural world without guaranteeing uh, human rights, human dignity, or social justice? This is, this is my honor to be here because all of our speakers who are sitting beside me are not only political decision makers, but they also come from academia and research, and I believe that it is the role of UNESCO to serve as a dialogue platform between researchers in, uh, in politics as well as uh, civil society and political decision makers. So this afternoon, we will begin our panel with Professor Alberto Maloney's presentation. He is the UNESCO Chair on Religious Pluralism and Peace at the University of Bologna. He also works at the John 23rd Foundation for Religious Studies. I would like to note here that UNESCO works closely with its partners, and these partners, of course, include the UNESCO Chair. It's a very important academic network, and uh, Professor Maloney is part of this network. Uh, this is one of the key pillars for inter-religious dialogue and intercultural understanding. This network includes 30 chairs and 26 countries. They have been meeting on a regular basis for the for the past several years since 2014. They have also been uh, meeting regularly thanks to the Baku forums, which is a good introduction to our speakers. So I would like to now give the floor to Professor Maloney, and then I will continue to introduce our speakers one by one. I hope that 10 minutes per presentation should be sufficient. We also have a short movie about the situation in Angola. And then, of course, you will be welcome to ask any questions. Now I would like to give the floor to Professor Maloney. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Maybe in English. Okay, I'll continue in English. To suggest to you is the use of two metaphors that in my... Uh, opinion could be useful to frame the topic uh, of uh, education and uh, multi-faith dialogue and uh, awareness. <clears throat> the first metaphor is a mef- metaphor concerning uh, the religious climate change. It is uh, one of my convictions that uh, we are in the midst of a religious climate change, uh, namely a global process in which uh, parameters that depends part on our decisions, part of what has been done in the past, are influencing the landscape, the religious landscape in the world. And if the metaphor of the religious climate change and the religious global warming is true, we may have a paradigm to explain uh, the, the, the rise of fundamentalism in all uh, religious traditions, 
uh, sometimes which much more visible and much more actual devastating uh, uh, aspect in other, in other case with less visible but not less important devastating uh, consequences. Uh, a fundamentalism that is quantitative and qualitative at the same uh, time and that is uh, uh, shaping the destiny of uh, the world creating a religious global warming. In this religious global warming, uh, the, the, the metaphor uh, has a role because uh, if you take what is happening about uh, the, the real climate change, the real global warming, we have the sense that something very unusual has happened in this world. Namely, on one side we have a tripolarity between a scientist, political decision, and public opinion. Uh, scientists are offering good results and solid data for understanding what was going on. Political decision makers are asked to transform this and implement this in, into political decision. And both the levels are influenced, are influencing the real behavior of the normal and ordinary people. When I was a young boy, we did not uh, divide uh, aluminium for, uh, from uh, paper. My grandchildren are doing uh, it when uh, they are one year old. Uh, my sense is that in the religious global warming and in the religious climate change, we need the three same pole plus one. Uh, the plus one is, of course, religious leaders. Religious leaders has a great uh, role, make uh, a great difference in the public discourse on uh, that, but they are not at all the only one who can shape the difference and the framework and to raise a multi-faith awareness, the sense of diversity, the respect of otherness. Uh, besides the religious uh, leaders, there, are, uh, there is a role of scholars. In many uh, religious traditions, uh, we have the sense that uh, the, the believers, the practitioners, are forgetting part of their own history, are forgetting the fact that as uh, each and every human uh, entity, even and all the religions are capable of the best and the worst and they should remember the best that they've done and the worst that they are capable to do to make an ethical decision on that. And in this sense, I feel and I think that the role of scholarship is exactly this, namely to restore, as uh, it is in the great and ancient libraries, uh, to restore a memory of what each of uh, us, each of you is capable to do. Uh, scholarship needs uh, uh, political uh, leaders and political decision makers that are capable to receive good data. Uh, I live in a continent, uh, Europe, in which uh, Islamophobia is growing, in which the sense that Islamophobia is like a road going into a great space of anti-Semitism is not, all, uh, not, not understood everywhere and by everybody. And in this continent, we need a reaction capable of, of, use, of making a good use of scholarship and academic research in order to prepare education. Because if you don't have education based on the teachers of the teachers, uh, shaped by good research, you will have simply a preaching of good values, and preaching is not always the best uh, solution. And the same times you need a public opinion. If you don't open the circuit between uh, religious leadership, religious scholarship, political leadership, and public opinion, uh, you will simply have a sort of moral uh, request. If you open this, education can have a great role. Education can uh, be a place in which excavating the source uh, of uh, everybody you can treat another type of difficulty, and uh, on this I will use my second metaphor. Uh, you can treat religious illiteracy. Not only in uh, Europe, uh, sometimes for political reasons, sometimes for demographic reasons, sometimes for social reasons, uh, all uh, the cultures and religions are floating on a great ocean of religious illiteracy. 
uh, we have done as a foundation a report on religious literacy in Europe. And so it, it, it is interesting that uh, among those who describe themselves as Christian people, they are incapable to guess the four of the evangelists mentioning the, th the first uh, three one. And uh, I, I, will, I will not make you laugh telling some of the response about what is the Last Supper. Uh, my Last Supper is pasta, of course, being Italian. Uh, in, in, into this uh, uh, climate change, religious literacy is a great enemy, and it should not be treated, it could not be treated simple by comparatism. There is a great illusion always and mostly among scholars, that is the illusion that uh, uh, comparatism is neutral and uh, theology is biased. It is not true at all. It is not true at all. Comparatism is a good way to make uh, religious uh, studies, to make religious history, to make history of religions, but at the same time you need something that is capable to uh, dive into the theological and philosophical uh, depth of uh, orthodox uh, theology, uh, Muslim uh, history, uh, Buddhist discipline, and so and so on. And so uh, to, to define our framework as a framework of a religious climate change in the religious global warming and our challenge as the challenge of religious literacy is in my view a way to put the issue of education in the proper place thank you thank you very much uh, professor meloni um, just now i was telling you about the unesco chairs and the for example chair twin for inter uh, religious intercultural dialogue and this network as I said meets on a regular basis for example during the international forum on intercultural dialogue in Baku which is held by Azerbaijan and I am therefore very happy to be able to welcome His Excellency Anar Karimov today. Baku hosts many uh, international fora, so they include they invite our chair on intercultural dialogue. There are political figures that take part, civil society, as well as uh, high-level representatives of intergovernmental re re uh, organizations. And UNESCO has played a very active role in hosting the latest forum in 2017. UNESCO is also working in close cooperation with the Ministry of Culture on designing the next round of this forum, which will be held in 2019. We call it the Baku process. It is 10 years old this year, and I am very happy to invite the ambassador to talk about his initiatives on intercultural dialogue. Thank you. Dear Madam Moderator, uh, dear participant of this international conference, good afternoon. It is my pleasure and honor to participate in this international peace conference, which is dedicated uh, to, to these important issues like intercultural interface dialogue. And uh, I'm very thankful to the organizers, uh, namely to the association of Master Ching Kung's friends at UNESCO, permanent delegations of the Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Sultanate of Oman and Nigeria for this brilliant initiative to bring us together to discuss these challenging issues of our time. Uh, as you have seen from the program and as Madame Moderator announced, my topic, today's topic is the Baku Forum uh, the interface dialogue and the results of the Baku Forum. And I will try to, to elaborate a bit more about the, the Baku Forums, its mission, the history of this process, why Azerbaijan started it, and our vision for future. So I divided my intervention into three parts. So starting with the history of this uh, 
Uh, it was launched in 2008 by the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan in the conference of the, uh, meet, uh, of the ministers of the Council of Europe uh, with the vision to create uh, a links between the ministers of the, of the culture of the Council of Europe and the ministers of the culture of the Organization of Islamic Conference. So that was the first initial step uh, to create uh, this common uh, ground for the discussions. Then there was a meeting of the Organization of Islamic Conference and the Azerbaijani government invited the ministers of culture of the European countries. So this is how it started and it turned to be a truly a global platform throughout the years and as it was also explained by the UNESCO uh, the Secretariat. And I'm glad to mention that this year uh, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of this uh, Baku uh, process. And uh, in order to further streamline uh, the principles and objectives of the Baku process, the government of Azerbaijan decided to organize on biannual basis uh, the World Forums for Intercultural Dialogue, starting from uh, 2011. Having received the huge success, this forum became indeed a glo global platform for promotion of ideas of interface and intercultural dialogue. And last year we had already fourth edition of the forum with its core aim to create a platform for people all around the world to talk, communicate, exchange views, create networking about intercultural and interface dialogue. The forum brings together politicians, religious leaders, academia, media, youth, making this platform a truly universal and inclusive, providing space for interactions among various stakeholders for, to promote and to keep higher on agenda the values of dialogue. It's obvious that this event raises awareness about interface and intercultural dialogue and attracts the attention of wider national and international public. However, we think that this event is not just for the sake of organization of big events. We think about the substance and we think about consistency, how we see the evolving uh, the process of the intercultural dialogue worldwide and what is going on in between of these forums. And here I would like to emphasize uh, the role of UNESCO and also its institutions like UNESCO chairs who helps a lot to build up this momentum and to raise awareness about the importance of dialogue. So we, we have to work hard to make this process continue. You know, when we are, we are asked about the, the, the values or the, the tangible results of this forum, I always uh, respond with the, with the answer that uh, several networks, several cooperation possibilities are being created after these uh, forums. Many people are meeting each other for the first time. Youth are meeting each other. I mean, youth, uh, media are getting together uh, for the first time. So it creates some bounds. It creates some networks and uh, communication, which is so necessary in, in today's uh, life. We are very proud that this forum becomes a huge success. But this is an evolving process. It was not, I mean, the success was not taken as granted. Uh, I just want to, to give you some statistics which will give you an idea uh, how we started and to what extent uh, we managed to de develop this platform. If in the first forums we had representatives only mainly from Europe and Asia, then in the last edition, in 2017, we had already more than 1,500 participants from 120 countries. 120 countries 
38 international organizations took part in, this, in the last edition of this forum. So this is another evidence, I would say, of growing interest of the international community to the values of dialogue, and it gives us confidence to, that we are on the right track, and it inspires us a lot to continue in the same spirit. But of course, when we speak about the success, we cannot under, underestimate the role of the partners. And here, I would like to refer to UNESCO, which is, I would say, the key and the main partner of this forum. And I'm very thankful to the Secretariat uh, for their efforts and for their assistance in preparing and in, in, uh, organiz in of the organization of these forums. Of course, uh, I would like to thank on behalf of my government other partners like the UN Alliance of Civilizations, uh, World Tourism Organization, Council of Europe, ISESCO, and others. You know, we invest a lot into this issue for many years, and one may ask why Azerbaijan is so keen and interested to, to, to promote intercultural dialogue. And here I would like to go to the second part of my intervention, which maybe explains, which will shed a bit of light, uh, why for Azerbaijan this issue is so important. You know, my country historically is situated on the crossroads of civilizations, at the very heart of the Great Silk Road, thus making my country and my, this, this area historically and naturally a sort of a melting pot of different uh, nations, ethnicities, religions, which makes us to be a bridge, a natural bridge between East and West. And this historical achievement is embodied in almost every monument, in every tradition, in the mindset of the people, and I would say generally in social and cultural landscape of the country. However, these long-standing traditions of tolerance and, and peaceful coexistence are not taken for granted. There should be appropriate and well-calibrated policy put in place in order to maintain the historical achievements of our forefathers. And the policy is there. Policy is there. My government, based on these strong values and principles, has placed intercultural and interface dialogue in the, forefront, in the forefront of its state policy priorities. With strong belief in notion of the unity in diversity, Azerbaijan spares no effort not only to promote these values nationally, but also to share this huge asset with the international community. Unfortunately, today we, are, we all witness several challenges undermining peace and security, such as violent extremism, terrorism, separatism, armed conflicts, and many others. And regretfully, numerous conflicts are occurred based on the interface differences and the hatred. And despite the efforts of the international community to address this perilous phenomena, problems still persist, which lead, leads us to acknowledge that hard power is not enough or not so efficient, so we need more soft power as preventing mechanism. If we invest in soft power at the very early stage, we may have less negative outcomes at the later stages. And the main tool in terms of soft power is a dialogue. We need platforms for dialogue, we need to promote the values of dialogue in a clear and consistent manner. And as I mentioned earlier, Baku process and the World Forums for Intercultural Dialogue is all about these important issues. More than 10 years, we are investing into this through these mechanisms, and we invite all stakeholders to support us in this uh, path. While we speak about, speaking about the importance of soft power, Again, I would like to refer to UNESCO, 
which is in line with other UN agencies, has enormous asset in terms of, in terms of experience and competence. The role of UNESCO's mandate is relevant than never before. This mantra we, are, we keep repeating here for many, uh, for many occasions. When it comes to our vision for future, what should be our priorities in terms of promotion and realization of interface dialogue as a part of normal daily life? It is, it is my strong belief that the main target audience must be youth. We need to educate them more, we need to invest to their future more, we need to show positive examples of dialogue and share the success stories. Today we all witnessed in mass media inter-religious, inter-ethnic and other clashes and conflicts. But do we have enough success stories presented by media? So I think no. So we need more coverage in media of these success stories of peaceful coexistence and tolerance. The other point is the need for understanding and dialogue from academia perspective. Here we had in our panel uh, Honorable uh, Mr. Meloni who spoke about the academia perspective on the intercultural dialogue. So we can discuss a lot the importance of dialogue but would, wouldn't be great if we could support these arguments with academic data and proof. And in this case I would like to congratulate UNESCO who is doing uh, some project in this uh, direction and working on this dimension and I wish them a lot, a lot of success in this mission. Another opportunity is the concept of which I would call a digitalization of intercultural dialogue. In the 21st century we definitely need to focus more on digital platforms, on social media. We think that this, the coverage of the social media and the, these platforms are huge and we are not using this potential. There is a still untapped potential which needs to be better explored and here I address to UNESCO to be more proactive uh, on, on, on this. It is my belief that considering current level of technological development and connectivity within this space, the online space can be another scene for the arena for the interface dialogue. Several projects can be realized in the online networks engaging more and more interest, internet users who are mainly actually young people. And while speaking about the target groups, of course in the process of promotion of intercultural and interface dialogue, all layers of the society should be involved, including youth. And in the end, maybe last but not least, I would like to go back to the, the topic of today's discussion, is education. I think the education lies in the heart of whatever we are doing in terms of dialogue, peaceful coexistence and many other issues. So we have to think, uh, we have to invest into education. But this is not only about education of sciences and etc. It's an education of shared values that are inherited by all religions. I think if we educate more and if we learn more about these common and shared values that uh, unites us, we can build the dialogue, we can be, build a successful dialogue based on this uh, very strong funda uh, fundament. Uh, in the end, I, I would like to conclude by highlighting, I mean again, this education with the words of the Malala Yousafzai. She is she's a Nobel Prize winner and a Pakistani girl who was persecuted uh, by the extremists in her country because of her aspirations of, of, uh, to education, because of her efforts to bring uh, the education in her country. And uh, in one of her uh, interviews, she appealed uh, to the world leaders, to the, those uh, leaders of the international community that 
instead of uh, bringing weapon army uh, uh, the weapon bring books instead of bringing soldiers uh, bring teachers so i think we have to uh, we have to uh, abide by this appeal to the world and bring education and teachers to uh, our world that's we can build a safer world and peace around the world i thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity to speak Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Since it's rather difficult to speak about intercultural dialogue without context, I'd now like to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, Jose, the Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of Angola to UNESCO. We're now going to be looking at the post-conflict situation in Angola, and since it's worth a thousand words, after uh, looking, watching the film presented, we're going to be looking at the role of religious leaders in the mediation between hostile parties, especially after the country uh, ra ravaged the country uh, up until 2002. Afterward, we will hear from the Director of Religious Affairs and Minister of Culture of Angola. But we will begin with Ambassador Jose. Merci. Thank you very much, distinguished moderator and colleagues, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Now, after hearing so many interesting and enlightening presentations, We've seen the wealth and the depth of this topic. The National Director of Religious Affairs of the Ministry of Culture of Angola would like to speak about the culture of peace and about religion in a concrete manner. That is how we can put, uh, how we can depict what the Angolan people have experienced after the 500 years of colonization by the Portuguese, which lasted from 19. 61 to 1975, on the eve of independence, the fight for national independence, there were three armed movements that fought against the colonial powers. There is the MPI, which is a popular movement for liberation of Angola, MLA, which is the National Front for the Liberation of Angola, and UNITA which was the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola. And you can see that on the eve of independence, this proclamation of independence that is on November 11, 1975, could not have been celebrated in a truly solemn ceremonial way. So the colonial powers were able to reestablish some of their power, giving some of that power to the government that should have legitimately been installed, been put in place. And there also was the proclamation of the Republic of Angola and its capital as well with various popular movements and other uh, joint movements that came together to proclaim the establishment of the Democratic Republic of Angola in the center of the country. And so these were essentially two countries. That's where this conflict began, a conflict over power in Angola. And we're talking here about the 1975 to 2002 time period. 
And he, we had a government that set up shop in the capital, and then you had the armed forces that were covering the rest of the country's territory. And there were various talks that took place with international mediation with many encounters as well, as you will see. We had uh, at least four, in fact. But the fact was that we were never able to establish a government that would reign over the entire country in a peaceful manner. And so here we are at this uh, important panel of this conference in order to present to you the experience of Angola and the activities undertaken by the Angolan churches in civil society and between the hostile forces in order to bring about lasting peace. And this peace we did indeed achieve on April 4th, 2002. So we'd like to ask you now to stay with us and take a look at these images which will show you a glimpse of what war was like, what traces of war left behind, the context of the war during which these churches uh, found their place in Angola, the activities of the missionaries and the entire community of Christian churches of all confessions that were constantly striving to achieve peace throughout the country through their culture and through humanity. So please take a look at these images which speak for themselves. Thank you. A Constituição da República de Angola consagra a liberdade de consciência, de religião e de culto, bem como a laicidade do Estado. De acordo com o censo geral da população e habitação de 2014, a religião católica é a mais praticada com 41% da população. Entretanto, o cristianismo corresponde a 79% das crenças religiosas no país, seguida pelas crenças animistas, islâmicas e judaicas. Entretanto, 12% dos cidadãos manifesta o ateísmo, ou seja, não pratica nem crê qualquer religião em particular. Atualmente, existem 83 igrejas... Currently. There are 83 recognized Christian churches and officially 1,106 religious confessions that are non-recognized, as well as 79 uh, para-ecclesiastical organizations. There also are four platforms for religious confessions that cover several churches that are not legal, uh, legal persons. There is a new bill that will be regulating religious activity in Angola. This is the encounter of the delegations of Christian churches and leaders of par political parties of the MPLA in 2001. 
churches and civil society are all searching for solutions in order to end the war through dialogue. Ao fim da guerra, fazendo fé na comunicação social, podemos dizer que quer aproximar-se. Agora, quando e como, é claro, não depende de nós saber. This is a meeting of Episcopal bishops of Angola, as well as those of Sao Tome and Principe. This is during the fifth day of celebration of re national reconciliation. On this occasion, the church will be reflecting on these events of the past and will be holding prayer sessions for peace and national reconciliation. National reconciliation gives rise to peace. This ministry, led by Your Excellency, is especially interested in national reconciliation. The internal services of this ministry could delay or accelerate this national reconciliation, depending on what services they provide. We are here due to the important role played by the Church in the pacification of the minds of men and women. And the leaders of this country need to show a great deal of courage if we want to have a true reconciliation. Porque será necessário muita coragem para que todos os envolvidos, todas as partes. They need to tell our people firmly that the time has come to end this war and to give ourselves the means to rebuild our country. É, é hora de juntarmos as mãos para juntos construirmos o nosso belo país. This is the Evangelical Baptist Church of Angola for peace. I call on you to put down your weapons and begin dialogue. De Angola, aleluia! Este jubileu vai se prolongar até o próximo mês de dezembro. Foram convidados ao ato inaugural entidades governamentais, representantes de ONGs e pessoas singulares. General Armando da Cruz Neto, que é o chefe do Estado-Maior General das Forças Armadas Angolanas, e o General Abreu Camorteiro, que é o chefe do Estado-Maior do Alto Comando das Forças Militares da UNITA. Venerando Rui, juiz, presidente do Tribunal Supremo, Dr. Cristiano André. Sua Excelência, General Higínio Carneiro, coordenador da Comissão de Gestão da Província de Luanda e ministro das Obras Públicas. Sua Excelência, o ministro da Cultura, 
Boaventura Cardoso, deputados da Assembleia Nacional, excelentíssimos membros do governo, líderes e representantes dos partidos, digníssimos membros do corpo diplomático acreditado em Angola, reverendíssimas eminências representantes das distintas confissões religiosas, digníssimos convidados, minhas senhoras, meus senhores. Estamos a viver um momento de paz maravilhoso em que Angola está a escrever uma das páginas mais gloriosas de toda a sua história. Quero vos saudar neste dia de hoje, nas vésperas do dia em que celebramos as assinaturas de paz para Angola. A luz da palavra de Deus, quando realmente todos estamos unidos, governo, governantes, todos estamos virados para Deus e para a sua palavra, então sim, Deus derramará a sua bênção para esse povo e os seus governantes. Este é o ano que com mais força se está a celebrar a paz em Angola. Paz à congregação do Senhor. Reina. Paz à santa congregação do Senhor. Paz, Angola. Paz, Angola. Paz aos angolanos. O povo angolano assinala no dia 4 de abril o segundo aniversário do Dia da Paz e Reconciliação Nacional, data que pôs fim ao conflito armado em Angola. Isso iniciou o processo de reconciliação entre os angolanos. Desta forma e pela vontade do Eterno Pai, Criador dos céus e da terra, reunimos-nos hoje neste lugar para, através deste culto de ação de graças, honrar e glorificar o seu grandioso nome, manifestando assim a nossa gratidão pela passagem de mais um ano de paz e tranquilidade que o país vive após a assinatura do memorando do entendimento do 4 de abril de 2002. por esta guerra inútil, meu Pai. Podemos estar aqui para te agradecer, ó Deus Pai, por tudo o que tens feito nesta nação angolana. Obrigado, meu Deus. Obrigado, Senhor, porque Tu, na verdade, és um Deus vivo. Pai, neste momento, nós queremos te dar ações de graça por tudo o que tens feito no meio da Tua igreja, no meio desta nação angolana. Queremos pedir ao Deus da glória que possas continuar a abençoar esta terra, possas continuar a unir este povo. A reconciliação, meu Pai, seja na verdade uma reconciliação nacional, uma reconciliação que atinja o todo o povo, Senhor. Aqui visite -se, dirija a tua e foze prosperar o nosso lado. Te rendemos imensas graças por aceitares que nos reunamos aqui, ignorando assim as nossas diferenças, 
estarmos aqui a dar-te graças, graças, graças ao Deus interno. Queremos te agradecer por este dia, Senhor, o dia em que os angolanos disseram é bom ser angolano, interessa ser angolano. As crianças, os jovens, os velhos orgulharam-se por serem angolanos, pois naquele dia pudemos saber que a guerra final podia parar, que podíamos continuar ou começar a reconstruir o nosso país. Minha terra, nossa terra, meu eu entra a multidão. Thank you very much for this very interesting film. It's very interesting to know how in the Angola context, religion is a force for social cohesion, but unfortunately it can also lead to uh, division. Now, Mr. Castro Maya, would you like to speak now? Okay. Thank you once again for this uh, presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to Her Excellency Irene Vaisvilaite, Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of Lithuania to UNESCO. Madam Ambassador will tell us about the experience of her country, which is a young democracy, in managing cultural and religious diversity. These are issues that uh, involve religious actors and impact social and political lives. Of course, these are issues not only for uh, young democracies, but for all of our societies. Thank you. You may have the floor. Merci beaucoup. Thank uh, you very much. And uh, uh, my intervention is rather a reflection based on experiences uh, coming from a passage from transition that we share with uh, Ambassador of Azerbaijan and uh, Lithuania shares with Azerbaijan as countries coming from Soviet Union. Uh, uh, so this uh, from very limited uh, religious freedom, very controlled religious life into uh, change of regime and change of uh, uh, attitude towards religion. Uh, and uh, I will talk not so much about uh, concrete case of Lithuania, but exactly about uh, young democracies and uh, what they face and how they, what they can learn and what the problems are in, uh, in, in the world of religion. So first of all, I'm very thankful to organizers of this organization that were already mentioned by distinguished ambassador of Azerbaijan for invitation to take part in this conference. Intercultural and interreligious dialogues are of utmost importance in modern world uh, that uh, already uh, Professor Meloni exposed. And it's really important that UNESCO pays attention to this question uh, because uh, I convinced that UNESCO is the most uh, uh, fitting uh, international and intergovernmental organization, but based on various levels on dialogue, uh, participation of experts, collaboration with uh, non-governmental partners, and that's exactly where we participate, to talk about religion, about dialogues of the faith, and probably come out with some recommendations for uh, international fora for diver different states. Since we are living in political world, faiths and religions are interdependent with states and political order. And political order does influence life of religious institutions and life of faith as well. As we know, very large variety of states, state-religion relationship exists starting from where, rare but existing uh, 
total hostility and not recognition of any religion and ending with theocratic state where actually one religion governs the state. The world is very, very diverse. Classical model for liberal democracy is neutral separation of state and religion that gives to all existing religions in the state freedom of self-organization and self-governance, does not interfere into religious matters, and does not privilege as well as dot, does not discriminate any religion. Of course, also in such model remains question of limits. How much can religion enter public space? Uh, how much religious convictions and religiously based cultural, dietary, uh, calendar uh, issues and order customs can be honored in public, in state life? Some liberal democracies stand for absolute neutrality of public space. Some are open to the presence of religious elements. Even in such space of liberal democracy as European Union, we have a big variety of national laws and state traditions regarding religion and religious. There are states that historically were multi-religious and even before democratic order had models of cohabitation of faiths. And there are states that were born or at certain moment became confessional states with one state religion and carried this model into democratic order. But democracy is favorable ground for interfaith dialogue on simple basis that without external political intervention, such dialogue can be free and genuine. And uh, uh, interfaith dialogue can be free and genuine when in that dialogue various levels of religious religion are participating. If religion has hierarchical order, it's also important that uh, faithful grassroots participate in dialogue. One problem of modern democracies, I would like to underline that many of them being focused on individual are not able to grasp communal character of religion as based not on principle of association, but on principle of belonging. To say it simpler, uh, belonging to faith or religion is closer to family relation than to being a member of party or of club. Uh, and uh, so because religions in general are treated like associations by many states, secular liberal democracies are totally indifferent to interreligious and interfaith dialogue as crucial to cohesion of society. If such dialogue is taking place, liberal democracies are not aware uh, of it and not really have knowledge on how such dialogue is led. Liberal democracies usually also are very bad on understanding how religious identity can be crucial part of identity and what would be protocol of such dialogue among identities. So developed democracies cannot offer real examples to young democracies in area of interfaith dialogue. And young democracies are the ones that deal with issues of religion in the most complicated ways. Young democracies usually derive from some less democratic form of governing and usually from less liberal attitude to religion in general and to organized religion in particular. It is not rule, but quite often, young democracies emerge from some larger states, and this makes them inherited, inherit different religious and ethnic groups. And quite often, ethnicity and religion also are linked. So the change of regime that gives possibility to all religious groups seek equal rights usually is met with distrust of religious majority if such exists in the state, towards such equality. And in the face of uh, democracy, majority, exactly because of democratic rules and procedures, can push for privileged position. 
If to check religious laws in young democracies, quite often we meet with not equal treatment of religious communities. And here I can give example of my country. Uh, religious laws were uh, introduced at the very beginning of our last independence. We have three ranks of religious communities. So-called tradition, that we have very large privileges, it's nine communities, so-called recognized by states, that uh, exist uh, at least 400 years on the soil of Lithuania, and the rest that are registered, they have a, a juridical persona, but um, no privileges at all. And of course, that's, that situation creates certain tensions among religious communities present in the state. Uh, so, uh, exactly, you know, and that, that's the result of democratic decision, law that was uh, accepted by the parliament. Because Catholics uh, uh, consider a very big majority, over 70%, uh, but it was based on that uh, uh, traditional, the oldest religions in Lithuania. Uh, some fates, fates in countries where oppressive regime equally persecuted all religions had better mutual understanding than they have it uh, now in young democracy. It was much more comprehension uh, um, towards one another as all were persecuted than now in uh, freedom situation. And uh, especially when uh, for political reasons some majority has privilege. Uh, it becomes even more complicated, as I already mentioned, when different faiths are connected with different ethnic groups, because then laws on religion merge with minority laws and can create very serious tensions. So, not so rare cases when in young democracies we have different degrees of state control of religion. And, uh, uh, as, as is opposed to liberal democracy, when state says does not control a religion. States of young democracies can even encourage and incite interreligious dialogue, but exactly such encouragement makes religions to act as state-controlled bodies and not as deeply committed to their faith communities that seek to understand their faith as a way to respect faith of another. So it is great initiative we are taking part of here, this conference on interfaith dialogue that can help us, representatives of states and representatives of religions, to ponder what is authentic interfaith dialogue that leads to peace, that challenges societies and can that changes societies and can change the world. We are on the road, and thanks to all that walk this road together. Thank you. Merci, Madame l'Ambassadeur. Madame Ambassador. Enfin, je souhaite la bienvenue Finally, à I would Firman like Matoko. to welcome Mr. Edouard Firman Matoko, who is the Assistant Director General of the Africa Department since 2016. Edouard is widely respected by all of his UNESCO colleagues. We are extremely uh, delighted that he was able to be here with us. Uh, Mr. Matoko is originally from the Congo. He uh, studied at uh, a uh, university, and I would like to uh, at a university abroad, and I would like to point this out because mobility at the university, being able to study in different universities, is a very important component of intercultural dialogue, and this is a direction that we are also working on together because being able to uh, allow students to cross borders is something that is of great importance to us. So he works in education. He began work, working on education in 1985. Later, he became a specialist on the program on peace culture starting in 1984. He was then director of several multi-country uh, bureaus in Bamako, and then eventually he returned to the headquarters as the head of the delegation for cooperation, intersectoral follow-up, and Africa Affairs in 2014. Mr. Matoko will tell you about our institutional memory on the culture of peace in Africa and 
he will tell you about some initiatives that have been undertaken recently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear friends, brothers and sisters, your excellencies. Welcome to UNESCO. First of all, I always like to remind our audience that whenever I walk into this building, I am struck by the motto of this building. This is the building of giving and taking, the foundations of peace. Giving and taking is the message of the Lord, which we projected onto the screen before the start of this conference. So we need to be able to both give and receive and take. And I think that this phrase really provides us with a great uh, summary of the culture of peace. Just to make a brief historical uh, comment, how did this idea uh, come about? This started in the 90s, this idea of culture of peace, especially for Africa. The 1990s were a time of change, of democratic transitions. There were con new conflicts that emerged after the fall of undemocratic states, and peace processes began uh, on the continent during that time as well. At the time, the Director General of UNESCO, uh, Mr. Federico Mayol, as well as uh, multiple ambassadors, many of whom are here with us today, for example, the ambassador of Yemen, began to think about the role of UNESCO and how UNESCO could contribute to all of these peace processes. In those years, we saw the Rwanda genocide, the revolution in Haiti, the war in Guatemala, in El Salvador. It is during those years that we began to see uh, the consequences of the fall of the Berlin Wall. This was really a decade of conflicts, and UNESCO could not remain on the sidelines. Of course, here it was, was not only important to talk about com communication, education, culture, and peace, but we also had to talk about creating knowledge, creating know-how to bring together these societies and establish peace and democracy. This is what led to us designing a concept that could unite all of these demands, unite all of these needs. And this is peace, or rather, we called it the culture of peace. This culture of peace is a set of values, behaviors, attitudes that allow us to prevent conflict and to live together. And I believe that it is starting from this moment that UNESCO started to reorient all of its at work in terms of programming to accomplish this goal. And it is at the same time that UNESCO began to talk about intercultural, interreligious dialogue. And of course, we had many difficulties in doing this, I would like to emphasize, because bringing religion to UNESCO means that we lose some of our neutrality, which didn't actually happen. But some member states uh, persevered, as well as uh, Africa directors, led to decisions that began to view interreligious, intercultural dialogue as a very uh, important part of all uh, peace and democratic processes. This is how in the 1990s, if you look at the UNESCO archives, you will see that UNESCO held the very first interreligious dialogue between the large face of this world. And UNESCO has always been able to invite religious leaders to speak here and to share their experiences. We also watched this video from Angola, which is very interesting, has very rich content, and we can see how the Catholic Church, uh, how religious leaders are invested in building peace. In Africa, we've had natural conferences on democratic transition. We supported them. We supported that they, they would be uh, held by religious leaders, not necessarily by believers, but by people who could transmit a message of peace. Now, today we are speaking of interreligious and intercultural dialogue. When we look at the invasion of certain groups in Africa, which hide behind religious ideology to try to impose their lifestyle on people, impose their interpretation of religion in the world, when we see this, it's important for us to continue this kind of interreligious dialogue. And let me give you the example of Africa. 
In Africa, uh, we have a movement attempting to bring different religions closer so that they can take a new look at conflict resolution, at peace consolidation. And I would like to add that we are not only speaking about Africa, we are speaking about regions as a whole. And this Congress in which UNESCO participated in Benin, in Benin, which is a very uh, diverse area, we heard uh, representatives of native uh, religions speak there, not Catholic, not Protestant, but rather native religions that arise out of African traditions and African beliefs. And it is this kind of interreligious dialogue that needs to be on the agenda. These forms of religious expression should not be forgotten in Africa. And so we are working on this at UNESCO to bring together all of these individuals who are working with religion. Let me give you another example another area in which we are going even further, when I look at the title of this conference, Dialogue and Education is what I see. So we need to educate people's minds. We cannot educate people's minds without educating their hearts, without educating that part of our being where we develop our religion, where we develop our faith in our community, and the understanding that we need to live in peace and to communicate with each other. So I think that here here, they are at the heart of an organization where you should not feel that you are a stranger. You are at the heart of an organization that will bring dialogue to all of its work. And in conclusion, I would like to say that when I speak of education, it's important to know that we cannot hold religious, interreligious dialogue just in UNESCO conference rooms. We must work in those places where the minds of people are formed in the education system. This is the goal of education. We must reform our education systems so that from the beginning, children learn to live together, live to coexist. This is the fourth pillar of what we call the treasures of education. I would really like to commend the initiative of the association uh, that organized today's conference. I would also like to commend all of those who are here at UNESCO. Now, here I'm, I'm speaking from, from myself personally. I heard your, the presentation from Angola, so I'm not speaking as the representative of an organization, rather as just myself. I believe uh, ambassador from the Africa group. We should have these kinds of initiatives on the African continent so that the African people can also use these initiatives to build an African land, the cradle of civilization, but which could also be the planet's cemetery, the planet's graveyard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very well. I'm not going to attempt to summarize the presentations of the panelists. I would like to thank each and every one of you for your very concrete descriptions of your work, for interreligious dialogue and intercultural dialogue. Now I would like to invite our audience to ask questions. We should have about half an hour for a Q&A session, so please feel free to ask uh, the panelists. Is anyone brave enough to ask the first question? Everyone's a bit shy. Would anyone like to address any of our panelists? Very well. I would like to ask a few questions. Oh, sorry, there's a question in the room. My name is Doba Noel Noirar. I'm an economist. From all of the experiences that you shared with us today, it appears to me that interreligious dialogue, which involves spiritual aspects, is legitimate in terms of 
involving various interests. So we talk, you mentioned values. What, what I'm saying is I think it would be useful to note that conflicts, especially armed conflict, arises out of conflicts of interest, especially economic interest. So in our approach to intercultural and interreligious dialogue, how are you trying to make these types of economic interests explicit? How do you outline them? This is the question that I have. So in other words, what is the, what is the role of economic actors in conflict resolution or peace building? The reason I'm asking this question is because uh, I heard all of your different experiences. For example, in Africa, many are concerned with raw materials. There might be internal conflicts, but there are certainly external factors involved as well. There are uh, foreigners who are involved in these conflicts in, on this issue of raw materials. But economic issues often cause Various problems, for example, in the 18th century when the science of economics was founded in the West with Adam Smith. Adam Smith, he appealed to our morals. He actually wanted to become a pastor, which he didn't do, but he was very much interested in the issue of values. So, so in 1749, he published a work on moral values, and 20 years later, he wrote The Wealth of Nations, the famous uh, work which is at the basis of our liberal economic system, the system in which we are living today. But he was also very much interested in values and interests, conflicts of interest. So given all of the presentations that we've heard today, are we not only looking at the values side without looking at interest and conflict of interest? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Would one of our panelists like to respond to this question? Ida. Uh, please, Ambassador. Yes, of course. Our presentations were particularly focused on the topic of the day. Although, of course, if we're talking about Angola, for instance, it's important to remember that the world went through a period when we used to have uh, different blocks. So we had, uh, for example, the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc during the, the Cold War. Angola began its fight for independence from Portugal, and at the, time, at the time we had three liberation movements, but these three liberation movements were supported by external powers. We provided equipment, for example, weapons, and the FMLA, which was the front for the liberation of Angola, benefited a bit more from the Western bloc. And the MPLA was supported by the socialist bloc. And the third movement was supported by China. They received military training from China. But, of course, when it comes to the actual territory, we always have our own resources, natural resources, and so on, because, for example, in Angola's case, there is a situation of instability leading to a loss of control over mineral resources. And the time used for negotiations was uh, constrained by external factors in order to better exploit these mineral resources. 
And so obviously economic interests play an important role. But as we have stated, it is true for the mentality, the mindset of the people. Now, Angola had the support of the international community and the United Nations. It took decades during which the United Nations spent more than $1 million per day for peace-building missions in Angola. But in 2002, the Angolans were able to stand up for themselves and establish an Angolan internal dialogue without any external influences. We were able to transcend our divisions and so we could say that previous to that, external interests uh, played an all-too-important role, but the resources still mainly came from the conflict. Thank you. We were origins of the conflict. If it's okay, I, uh, I will speak in English. Uh, it's a very good and very interesting question, but also it's quite focused uh, on the Western understanding of religion and economy as two separated things. It's already modern thinking. And uh, at the same time, uh, on the experience that uh, religion can be easily, religious belonging, religious identity can be quite easily instrumentalized uh, in situation of conflict. Usually religion is taken in the conflict as uh, in manipulative way, in instrumental way. Uh, but what we have in, its, uh, in, in the Western order uh, is that uh, even though religions that present uh, are present in Western, uh, I would say Abrahamic, first of all, religions, they have very strong social teaching in themselves. But the separation of state and church and the fact, you know, that religion as system was actually excluded from the state and therefore from secular, from material order, uh, religions talk to themselves about it, but uh, we are divided as persons. Uh, in secular world, uh, Christians or uh, Jews or uh, uh, Luther, I mean Christians, yeah, or, uh, or even Muslims, but in the Western world, they cr act according to the rules of secular world. Uh, and it's also very interesting that inter-religious dialogue, uh, as it led up to now, usually on hierarchically high level, is about high theology. It does not go down. For example, Catholic Church has very developed social teaching. Uh, but I'm not aware of interreligious dialogue to go on social matters. Even among on ecumenical dialogue, among different Christian confessions, it's quite different approach to that. And even if we see how Pope Francis is being criticized for his social standings inside of Catholic Church. Uh, and that usually comes from exactly that division, you know, let's talk about morals, let's talk about life, but don't touch social and don't touch economy. Uh, so that uh, schizophrenic uh, uh, religious man of West is actually influencing very far, uh, I think, and that's, that's my commentary. Thank you. Just like to remind you that uh, the international decade of rapprochement of cultures has been mentioned several times during this conference, and UNESCO is uh, spearheading this international decade's coordination. And in 2014, when we held the first meeting of experts on this international decade to launch this decade, there was a speaker present, also an associate of UNESCO, Didier, who made the following remark. He said, we must remain vigilant 
la, le nom même de la Because the very name International Decade of Rapprochement of uh, Cultures entails a separation of, UNESCO, of cultures, whereas at UNESCO, in all of our programs since the very beginning, fait, we've been uh, actually working culture, on the concept of culture, the fact that all cultures are interconnected and interdependent, the fact that no culture can stand on its own and is an island into itself and can survive by itself. Therefore, we are very clear indeed on that point, um, this uh, com diplomatic compromise that you had to undertake. This is indeed UNESCO's mandate to work on this uh, area and as well as other uh, UN agencies that work on issues like justice, like economics, and so on. Une autre question? Oui? Any other questions? Yes? I'm an anthropologist, and I simply wanted to say that in order to work effectively toward intercultural dialogues, we need this dialogue between cultures, but it actually is based on the presumption that there is no dialogue between cultures. It's actually calling into question the idea of endogenous culture. You see, we are living in a historic era during which the uh, former colonialized states have been colonized states are living independently. But this work is not over yet. This work on cultural independence. We should not be calling into question the issue of endogenous culture. I think that within African societies themselves, where there are many conflicts emerging today or continuing, for example, uh, ethnic conflicts, we still have a great deal of work to do. And I think that it's UNESCO's task to ensure that we are moving towards confirming the concept of endogenous culture. In 2000, I propose a definition of culture, according to which culture is the set of values transmitted from generation to generation without the consent of the descendants. So when we actually consent to call into question this foundation of culture, then it's no longer possible to speak about any intercultural dialogue. And that's because culture calls itself into question here. This is a certain structure provided to a people. So I think that we need to be quite clear on the fact that the economy is just one aspect of culture. Out of everything that makes up culture, material culture, or intangible culture, for example, here we need to look at the issue of dialogue without questioning endogenous culture. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Excellence, chers panelists, une réaction? Your Excellencies, panelists, do you have any responses to that? Are you all in agreement? Est-ce que une autre question? Are there any other questions among the audience? Oui, madame, s'il vous plaît. Yes, madame, go ahead. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for this conference, which has taught us many things and been quite enriching. I have a question that is quite complex, perhaps. Like, or, oh, I'm sorry, I'll first introduce myself. I am a doctor. I am the wife of the former Chargé d'Affaires of Madagascar at UNESCO, Secretary General of the uh, Association for the Friends of Master Ching Kung at UNESCO. And I had a comment about education because it is multifaceted. Now, as a diplomat, as someone who is very active in society overall, this multifaceted nature of education, as mentioned in a previous conference, actually implies that 
we are already accepting the fact that the identity of the people who are being educated is set in stone. When we talk about an intercultural dialogue or interreligious dialogue, we all know that dialogue involves two parties, at least, that will engage in exchange. But as Goethe said, quite often, talking is a necessity, but listening is an art. And those engaged in dialogue often forget uh, what a Greek philosopher already mentioned, who already said that in dialogue we should not perhaps talk too much. Rather, we ought to take a humble approach that would give more space for the other party. Now, for us as Christians, I am a Protestant Christian. I am a part Anglican, in fact, this is a confession. We believe that we need to ensure not to shine too brightly on this earth, but also not to withdraw too far into ourselves. We need to find the happy medium. And so my comment is that you, I'm sure you all know that a successful education is provided to well brought up children and provides it with provides children with a strong foundation as well as with powerful wings, wings that would allow a child to travel as far as possible towards the other. So my question, I know that we could spend years talking about this issue, especially at UNESCO, because we do need to build build peace by understanding who we are and where we want to go. My, ish, my question, my comment is that our world is constantly changing, constantly evolving, and we are having a lot of difficulty uh, remembering what our fundamental values are and finding uh, an anchoring point in our identities and a compromise between what we want to keep and what we want to share with others. And so perhaps some of us are unable to put down roots that are deep enough. The roots are too shallow, and perhaps our wings are too small, too weak. People don't know necessarily who they are and also don't know where they want to go. Therefore, this is more of a comment, I suppose. But if any of you have any reactions to or any comments on how we could put down deeper roots while searching, seeking for uh, universal wisdom, understanding human nature, even if we don't have a miracle solution, how can we spread our wings in this dialogue? Thank you. Uh, oui, on pourrait... Yes, we could spend decades discussing this question indeed. Now, education, as we've heard, is like the myth of Sisyphus. We need to work every day fighting an uphill battle. And this is the work that UNESCO is engaged in for education, for peace, global citizenship, and so on. Our goal here is perhaps to overhaul the current educational systems in our societies. We've heard about colonialism and in cultural independence. We also need to keep in mind that every society has been formed through education, including within the family. But uh, many things mold a child as it grows up. And what is education for our children these days? It's not just their family. They have many other means of learning and developing. And so in an African country with many young people, for example, these young people may ask, why do I have to go to school? Because I can find all the answers that I want on the Internet. And that's true. So when you have this kind of widespread feeling, the only answer that we can give is that that we, within the educational system, ought to question ourselves every day so that we can make sure education is adapted to the needs of these children and young people. I think that your comments were entirely relevant. And in this current context, interreligious and intercultural dialogue, if you can transcend the existing dogma in education systems, then what remains afterward? And this is a very important question when it comes comes to interreligious religious dialogue. What is left for us to discuss, for us to dialogue about? 
This is sort of these moving goalposts. What we see in the north of Mali, what we see in the extremist uh, machine, which is currently threatening our society's cohesion. I believe, well, this is a comment here, but again, we could talk about it for a very long time. But my point is that we need to be vigilant every single day with regard to what education is doing for our children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. Any other questions? Yes, Ambassador, go ahead. Thank you very much for this question. Actually, it, it, it perfectly fits uh, to our vision that dialogue is not, uh, is not a, the process. I mean, it, it entails uh, the multidimensional uh, participation and involvement of um, different uh, aspects and different factors of the society. Uh, for, for me, in my view, uh, the dialogue uh, depends on two key issues, respect of each other and the acceptance of the differences. Only with these two aspects we can uh, speak about the success of the dialogue. And when we speak about uh, the respect and the acceptance of the difference, I think the prerequisite of this is the education. So we have, to, uh, we have to provide, we have to ensure the education, but not education in, in maybe in general understanding of, of sciences, etc. Per, perhaps the well-educated person in the world can be intolerant to, the other, to others' opinions. So we have to, to speak about the education of culture of peace, education of, of the peaceful coexistence and in my intervention I mentioned that the education lies in the heart of, of, of the dialogue and it, in the education which uh, I, I, I the, the education that I meant is about uh, the, the shared values that we uh, all religions are inherited so we have to build uh, the knowledge of, on those commonly and shared values. By this, we can speak about the respect, we can speak about the acceptance of the difference, and this will lead to the success of the dialogue. Thank you. Merci. Professor Meloni, ensuite peut-être Madame l'Ambassadeur. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Ambassador, please. Well, uh, uh, a remark uh, uh, co continuing uh, uh, my distinguished colleague, uh, in education, when we talk about values, we use, uh, uh, or, uh, in general, we use already, you know, not religious term, but all religions, uh, and with that also, you know, all traditions, it has a base for dialogue, and that base for dialogue is called hospitality because the custom of hospitality that is in every culture, uh, some are very close to it, some are quite distant already to the concept and to all protocol of hospitality that is based on acceptance of difference of another person. Guest is a stranger. Guest is different. But you have all the attitude, ethical and religious, to accept guests in certain ways. And what was very interesting and what is interesting, that hospitality, you can go in uh, Bible, you can go in Quran, you will find everywhere. <laughs> but it also gives obligations to the guest. How to be a guest, how to treat uh, the, the, the host. So that's for the dialogue, you know, we cannot, I think, uh, we not, then we're not going into abstractions. And I think in education, this concept, well forgotten, but also very important to remember in a certain way, is, is very important. Thank you. Merci, Professor Meloni. I'll just speak for a few minutes and then go back to the question asked by uh, the lady in the audience. I think that when we use categories in this field, we are talking about a certain kind of literacy. 
that we're trying to navigate. And this concept of dialogue does not impose anything, does not assume anything. We've given the idea of dialogue certain dimensions, for example, into religious dialogue. There it's obvious that there is a transmission of diplomatic models, imposition of that transposition of that into a living community. And there's also the issue of having to find someone that can be an authority or that can speak on behalf of authority, speak to authorities on behalf of those who cannot do so. And the idea of hospitality as well, yes, there is respect, mutual respect and esteem, and there is a process that's very difficult for us to understand in this postmodern era in which we are currently living. That is to say that we are often uh, basing our thoughts on common values that we want to extend to everyone, as if we're all sitting on the same table eating the same meal, that is common values that would be acceptable to everyone. But actually, right now, we see that in the process of the growth of fundamentalism, it, we must look within each religion and community and culture, even if, of course, culture is, is a very fake concept in itself. But within these groups, there are resources for good and for evil. And in Europe, when we recall that the Jews were expelled by the Catholic reign of Isabel, Queen Isabel of Spain, they did not look for hospitality in Istanbul with the Muslims and Christians until much later, and when there was a very large Jewish community there. And in New York, there was a large community later on. But here, there is the valuable notion of helping the other, and this should be brought into our own psyche. The question uh, that was asked, a very important question about the change in the religious landscape today, there's not only the feeling that globalization has perhaps led to deep divisions, but there's also the case that in identifying each religious environment or, or uh, cultural environment, there is a constantly evolving process. I just attended a seminar of Montserrat during which we analyzed a number of uh, Pew Center maps on the development of religions throughout the world, and it was quite clear then that there were a large number of uh, Africans and Asians that will be predominant in the world by 2025. And uh, you'll see that Christianity is dominated by uh, European and Latino American identity, for example. But this is changing now. And we wrote about uh, the Christi Christianity, Christian communities in Africa, evangelism, and so on. And in this community, there is a question that links education to all other dimensions, not just uh, diplomatic dialogue between well-identified entities, but also this cultural dimension that is much broader. That is to say that the very air that you're breathing might give you some means, some tools to understand others. And in the foundation of Boulogne, we worked in order to gain the approval of the European Commission in order to construct a European Center for Religious Studies. And what I mean by European here, we want to create a center that could provide access to digital and to physical tools that we needed in order to train experts. Because in this religious field, there are many arguments that may be uh, sound or maybe less so, maybe naive, but we don't understand the external world, perhaps. And three years ago, we established 
an association, European Academy of Religion, which is open to research institutions in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the Balkans, and Russia. And this was not an easy task because there's a certain necessity, an expectation. We're having a forum in which people could uh, engage in discussions, all of these cross-cutting areas that link religions. And it's important to uh, focus on education here because good intentions in education, of course, are important, but we don't have the right alphabet, so to speak. We may end up uh, disseminating values that may not necessarily be constructive, for example, religious pornography on the Internet, which are very tempting and have strong influence on people. Thank you very much, Mr. Maloney. I do have to admit that uh, Madame the Ambassador and I seem to be in the minority here as women on this panel. And of course, uh, young people, the youth, uh, are a priority area when it comes to intercultural and religious dialogue for us. But what about women? So I'd like to ask Edward now. Well, there was an initiative launched in 2014 on the network of uh, women for a culture of peace in Africa. Could you give us some more information about this initiative, this network, and its goals? Yes, of course. And I also would like to remind you all that in all of the processes of controversial resolution, women play a very important role. And in all of the conflicts we've seen in Africa, all the way up until today, many of these conflicts were actually prevented or ended thanks to the unofficial or official role of women. And based on this observation, UNESCO, which is mandated to establish uh, networks to facilitate uh, contact between various groups, based on this observation, UNESCO supported the establishment of a network of women for the culture of peace, which is still in progress. And, uh, is taking place, for example, in Central Africa. At the same time, we've also established a network of young people for the culture of peace in Africa, which is already also underway, operational, and has several different uh, chapters in Africa. And so we can see that young people and women all over the continent are able to communicate with using new technology, are able to share their experience, are able to support one another uh, during difficult times, and so UNESCO must learn from these people in order to improve our methods of intervention in these in this area. Thank you. Uh, sir, you have the floor. Can you give them the microphone, please? In the front. Good evening. My name is Mr. Matamak, and I also gave a presentation during the beginning of this wonderful conference. I presented on the first day of the conference. Of course, I completely agree with the analyses that have been shared here today, but I think that it would also be important to in the case of Africa, but also for the rest of the world, pay particular attention to some very simple ideas. And what are these simple ideas? For example, the fact that interreligious dialogue must take place. It must take place everywhere because it's a necessary step in order to uh, build peace in this world. But at the same time, we must take into account uh, people's mentalities, our ways of thought. Different people's essentially automatic reaction. Essentially, we, before uh, someone finishes their thought, we already think that we know what, what he wants, or what he's going to do. And in this dialogue, we must remember that there are certain uh, areas of the world 
uh, that have still not uh, been heard. They have still not been able to make their voices heard, and we cannot judge them before we hear them out. We need to listen to them unconditionally in these kinds of circumstances so that we can hear what Africa, for example, has to say, not because, because the person speaking is a woman or a young person. Uh, a woman can either be ignorant or smart. A young person can be motivated or unmotivated. The main issue is as soon as we look at different areas, we need to ask ourselves what kinds of experiences do people here have? How do they think? What kinds of experiences that they have that could enrich what we want to say and what we have been saying for the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but which still doesn't work? So what we need is innovation. And innovation also requires creation and not just uh, and not just artistic creation, because we can we can look within these issues to find solutions that can bring us together. So I believe that the, I, this idea of uh, dialogue as a whole and interreligious dialogue specifically is as follows. If we have dialogue, then we can make a contribution. If, we, if, if there is religion, then that makes a contribution. We need to listen, we need to understand, and we need to take into account what those whom we will meet can teach us. Now, maybe we won't learn anything from them, but it's still possible. And this will allow us to uh, upgrade some of our mental categories, our way of thinking, and take these views into account when we restructure our dialogue. Thank you for your comments. I think everyone will probably agree with the point that you just made. So it is 4 o'clock. I would like to thank you very much for listening to us, for actively participating in our discussions. Uh, thank you, distinguished excellencies, professors, um, dear Edouard. Thank you for all of the participants of this very, very um, impressive panel. Panelists. May we invite the panel for a group photo on stage?